morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another episode of Behind the Business Book. I'm your host, Eric Lewis, and today I have with me Cynthia Zygman. She's the founder and president of Second City Publishing, a literary agency and publishing consultancy representing business authors, among a lot of other genres. But um, but in her capacity as uh, representing business authors is what she's doing with us on the show today. Before launching that agency, um, she held positions with some of the biggest names in business publishing, including John Wiley and Sons and uh, another publisher that was eventually acquired by McGraw-Hill. Formerly in Manhattan and Chicago, she now lives in Madison, Wisconsin. So, Cindy, thank you very much for uh, for taking the time to talk to me today. Well, thanks for having me, Derek. I'm I'm happy to be here and excited to talk with you. Would you mind just giving us a little bit of a, a sketch of of your history? It's not every literary agent that wants to represent business books, much less that has uh, a background. Um, in, in publishing and, and editing and representing them. So would you give us just kind of a the the short version of, of how you came to um to work with business books? I'd I'd be happy to. I actually started off in publishing. I started my career with John Wiley and Sons and I actually started there because I walked through the door needing a job. I had just relocated from Boston to the New York area. And that actually started my love affair with business books because Wiley, as you know, is a a huge business book publisher. Um, So I started working on those books and then jumped over to another publisher called Van Nostra and Reinhold, which was launching a business line, so I helped them do that, and then eventually ended up at um, Irwin Professional Publishing, which is the company that was acquired by McGraw-Hill, where I focused exclusively on business books. So it's just something I kind of acquired along the way and really fell in love with it. I mean, if you talk to anybody in publishing, they'll tell you that as long as they're working on books, it really doesn't matter what the topic is. And I do a number of genres, but business book business books um, tends to be where my my heart lies because of my background. And I also happen to have a business degree. That's just coincidental. That wasn't deliberate at all. And then I finally ended up at um, Dearborn Publishing, best known as being one of the country's top real estate publishers. Um, running their business imprint, which was then acquired by Kaplan Publishing. And at that point, I was in business, I was in pu- the publishing business for you know, probably close to 15, 20 years, and I had the opportunity to do something different. I loved working on books, I loved acquiring, but I also wanted to try something different and um, became an agent, and here I am. So what is, what's changed during, uh, during all of those, those years, from, from the time whenever you first walked through the doors for John Wiley to today whenever you're an agent? How is the, and specifically for business books, how well, is the... Um, obviously, technology has played a huge um, a role in that. I mean, when I started, there was no Amazon. It didn't exist. Um, Borders and Barnes and Noble were basically your Amazon of that of that time. And um, audio books were not as popular as they are today, even in in, in business publishing. And Authors didn't necessarily need to have the platform that publishers require today. Um, Publishing has become, it it always was a complex business, but it's become even more complex with all the mergers and acquisitions and the um, ability to get books out more quickly and also with social media. 
uh, there's just a lot more information out there. So uh, when publishers look at a book today, it needs to be something that people are going to be interested in 12 months from now. Um, or will they have read all about it already on the Internet or on Facebook or wherever it is they're getting their information? So from that perspective, it's changed. Um, again, the technology and the fact that authors really need, especially with business books, a strong platform. They need to have um, a place from which to launch their message and something that the publisher can tap into. So whether that's um, what we're doing now, um, a, a, an online blog, or whether it's a, um, a robust speaking schedule, uh, whether it's a strong Facebook following, a strong consultancy, something where they're going to come to the publisher with an audience all set to go. And that's a, that's a pretty tall challenge because there are going to be plenty of, of authors who have they they may be suc even successful professionally, but if they don't already have that platform um, established and kind of ready to go, then the the chances of of actually landing a traditional publisher are going to be much slimmer. Slim to none, frankly, um, because again, because there's so much being published now. Um, Self-publishing has, you know, moved from being looked at as you can't get published anywhere else, so you're going to publish on your own, to, you know, people taking it really seriously and doing a really nice job. So there's all of these self-published books out there, plus all of the commercial books out there. And there are lots of, you know, different sized publishers, several of which focus on business books, um, many of which don't. So there's just a lot out there, and it's important for an author to be able to differentiate himself. It's not, it's not, it's just not good enough anymore to have the best book written on sales or leadership or innovation. It needs to be the best book, and the author has to have a way to help the publisher get the word out there. So again, whether that's you know a really strong network of followers, or whether it's um, someone who has a lot of corporate clients that they can approach to help, or whether they're a professional speaker, whatever it is, it needs to be more than just having a really good idea and having those credentials. So, Cindy, let's let's jump back actually to um, to introducing you as a as a literary agent. You talking about you launching your own agency. I still talk to to authors and and plenty of people um, who, who aspire to be authors who don't really understand what a literary agent is, or are completely unaware of of even what literary agents are. So if you had to explain yourself to a, a group of, of people who wanted to be published but had no idea what an agent was, how would you explain what you do? Well, an, a, an agent is the publisher's advocate. You know, just like you, you know, you, you wouldn't enter uh, – uh, any other agreement with some kind of advocate, whether it's an attorney, a real estate agent, whoever it is, you want somebody that knows the ins and outs of that business and can help you navigate it. An agent um, works with an author 
before the book is presented to a publisher. So when you're working on a proposal, the agent has the experience to tell you, you know what, if you do this, this, and this, publishers are going to be interested. If you don't, then they're not. Um, an agent will also be candid with you and let you know whether or not your idea, while it might be a great idea, isn't going to be commercially viable because it's too narrow in focus. An agent will help you get your proposal and your project in front of a publisher. And frankly, some publishers don't accept unsolicited projects. They require that they go through an agent because they know an agent will have vetted the project, will have gone through the proposal, will make sure there's a sample chapter that's been well written and edited, will do all of those things so they don't have to sit there and weed through all that. And once a publisher expresses interest, your agent will be able to negotiate a deal for you. Um, including contract terms, royalties, advances, due date, whether or not you should give a publisher the option for your next work. There are lots of things that um, most authors, you wouldn't expect an author to know these things that an agent knows because an agent's been inside the business. I um, am somewhat unique in that I have been in publishing. I ran a publishing division, so I have a thorough understanding of what publishers can and can't do and what they are and are willing to do. And so I'm very helpful with authors that way. Um, and if an author is being unrealistic, I can tell them that. If a publisher is being unrealistic, I can tell my client that. And once a contract is signed, then ways. But an agent, you know, if, if you're working with your publisher and you don't like the cover, if you don't have an agent, there's really nothing you can do. If you have an agent, that agent can advocate for you and can talk to the publisher and help them understand why um, you don't like yellow on your cover or why that title just doesn't work. And an author, um, so so we're there for our authors the for the life of the book. And when we get those royal, royalty statements that come through, we scrutinize them. If there's an issue, we'll go to bat for you and find out what the problem is. And we're we're there for you. And while your editor, your acquisitions editor, for sure is your in-house advocate your editor still works for your publisher. Your agent works for you. And that's a really important thing to, to matter, to, to keep in mind. And that's an important thing that matters to you as an author. So whenever you were describing agents as, uh, as advocates, I was thinking of, um, of, uh, of a lawyer, right? So it, most people wouldn't dream of trying to, to go to court uh, and represent themselves, even though they have the, the legal right to, to do so, because they don't know the, the ins and outs, the, the legalities. It's it's just it's almost crazy to try to go represent your, yourself. But, I, but a, a literary agent is actually one step further, because there are plenty of, of publishers, especially the major houses, that won't even uh, allow you to represent yourself. Like you said, they they say um, either no direct submissions or no unsolicited manuscripts, meaning that it can only come uh, through an agent. So the so those authors who don't want uh, to work with a literary agent or, or don't take the steps to be represented by them, they um, they can't even get their manuscript their proposal uh, to an acquisition editor's desk. That's correct. That's correct. And that's, you know, primarily because, frankly, editors have huge workloads. I mean, they, they, get, they get, you know, a dozen or more proposals a day. So they, you know, they, with, with very few exceptions, they, 
they just don't have time to sit there and try to figure out, well, if this, if there's some work done to this, does it have potential? They want to be sure that, again, what they're getting is vetted. I mean, I've, you know, I've had clients come to me who have spoken with editors at houses. I mean, they've managed to get that far, but the editor said to them, look, I like what you're doing, but you need to go through an agent because that agent's going to, you know, help you navigate this process. And again, because agents know what can and cannot be negotiated, that's who publishers want to work with. They, you know, they don't really want to negotiate with an author who just doesn't really understand that part of the business. Now, you know, I would be lying, of course, if I said that every publisher out there requires agents. They don't. Um, but every publisher out there will work with agents. So, you know, even if you were to be lucky enough to find a publisher on your own, it may still be worth your while to bring on an agent as a partner to protect your interests. Um, I can't tell you how many authors I've spoken with who agreed to things that they just never should have agreed to because they didn't know. Can you name something off the, the top of your head, something that comes to mind? Um, well, um, one would be the option, and another would be the um, certain royalty terms. And another, although this is becoming less and less an issue, is copyright. Some authors will sign away copyright. So what is um, what is uh, the the option you were talking about? The option is most publishers will want an author to agree to give them first right of refusal on their next work. And that's particularly true of first-time authors because a publisher, as is an agent, they're, they're putting a lot into developing an author. So they want to be sure that they get the right to see the next work before it's shown to anyone else. And that in and of itself is not generally a problem. It's some of the specific terms that are a problem. For example, some options will specify that you will agree to exactly the same terms or you will agree to give them six months to review a proposal, which is crazy. So an option or a first right of refusal, again, is not in and of itself a bad thing, but the exact terms can be really detrimental. Uh, so the um, the second thing you said there was uh, was about royalties. So let's let's talk about what authors should and shouldn't um, expect or agree to when it comes to royalties. And then um, would you mind explaining? Uh, you know how how literary agents get get paid, which is sure, sure. Um, in terms of royalties, roy royalties are every publisher is different. So I can't I I can't sit here and say you know you're going to get X percent from this. Uh, you're going to get X percent uh, because again every publisher is different. Um, but most publishers do offer a royalty. A royalty, you know, can be anywhere depending on where the book is sold, anywhere from, you know, a few percent up to 25 or perhaps even 50 percent. And again, that, you know, that frankly depends on the project, on the author, and where the book is being sold. If a book is being sold um, as an e-book, the royalty rates can be a little higher if a book is being sold as a paper copy, um, they're generally lower. Um, the thing to, to keep in mind is that you're getting a royalty in exchange for allowing the publisher to 
use and exploit your content. So they're going to be doing things that you don't have to do as a self-published author. They're going to make sure that your book is developed um, by an editor, that it's professionally copy edited, it's typeset, it's proofread, that it's available in many different electronic formats, um, that in some cases published as a hardcover and then followed up with a paperback. They'll also, um, d again, depending on your arrangement with your agent, um, they'll shop around international rights. So there are, are, are lots of things going on behind the scenes that authors don't always realize because they'll see a royalty amount, let's just say 15%, and say, well, that's crazy. I'm writing this book and I'm only getting 15%. Well, you're getting that because the publisher is doing all these other things. They're distributing your book literally around the world. Um, and that's, and they're going to help you promote it and work with you to get, get the word out. Um, in terms of how agents get um, compensated, we're paid on commission. So we're paid um, based on what you get. We get a percentage of your royalties. Uh, so, you know, if you're getting... 15% uh, royalty, your agent may be getting 15 or 20% of that royalty amount. Um, your agent does not get paid until the book is placed. Um, they, you know, and then once the book is placed, they get, you know, a percentage of your, whatever percentage of your advance. So if the commission is 15%, they're going to get 15% of your advance. When your advance earns out, they're going to get 15% of whatever royalties you're getting. And most agencies, um, and our agency certainly does this, we have the royalties uh, sent to the agency. We review the statements, and then we um, then pay our authors the balance after taking out our commission. And that's standard in the industry. There are some um, agents out there that do it differently. And both are acceptable means of getting paid. You know, one of the, I think probably the best analogy I've ever heard about uh, publishers and, and authors and, and books, it likens it to uh, venture capital. So the, the venture capitalist would be the publisher. The entrepreneur seeking funding would be analogous to the author. And then the product that they're looking to sell would be the, uh, would be the book in this analogy. And so the, the publisher, excuse me, the, the venture capitalist puts up um, a lot of money, a lot of their money, and takes a lot of risk on a relatively unknown entrepreneur who is – developing a, a product that may or may not be completely finished yet. And so it's risk versus reward. So since the venture capitalist is putting in a lot of risk and a lot of, a lot of money up front, they get a lot of equity in the company. The entrepreneur is putting in his time, but that's time that he was going to put in anyway. Um, and so it, it makes sense whenever you come at it from a risk versus reward that uh, that a publisher who's putting in all of this uh, money up front on a product that may or may not sell, and quite frankly, a lot of books uh, don't. I forget what the numbers are, but there's there's a certain uh, um, number of books. I don't know, twenty, thirty something percent, and and feel free to absolutely correct my number, Cindy. That totally flop. There's another thirty or forty percent that um, are mid-listers. They kind of keep the, they pay the bills and they keep the lights on. And then there's a few uh, per, up at the, the top of the, the peak of the pyramid that are the best sellers, the, the blockbusters that really make the, the, the money. Um, and so they're, they're invest from the publisher's point of view, they're investing in a lot of different product projects, books, hoping that a few will be the the ones that actually pay off. Some will be the mid listers, and they've also got to recoup enough money so that the ones that totally flop don't uh, bankrupt the 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 company. 
That, that's yeah. absolutely correct. That you're you're spot on, and what an author brings to the table depends on how much risk a publisher is willing to take. So if you come to a publisher with a really strong platform, you've got you know you've got 500,000 Twitter followers that, you know, are avid about listening to what you have to say, you're going to get a better offer, a better package, a bigger advance from that publisher because you're actually helping them reduce the risk. Um, I will tell you, and, you know, sometimes authors, you know, don't, don't really understand how much uh, how much a publisher is investing in a book, and you know every book that comes out is probably, you know, a midlist book is a fifty to a hundred thousand dollar investment by a publisher. So if you're not getting, you know, if you're not earning money, if you're not making money on your book, your publisher isn't either. So they're really looking for those books that are going to break out and. They also like those books that, you know, maybe they're not going to be breakout books, but you know what? They're going to be here for 10, 20, 30 years. You know, those what color what color is your parachute types of books, those evergreen books that just sell and sell and sell. Because every time a publisher signs a contract, they're going into it with the expectation that they're going to get two or three more books out of you. Um, they publishers really don't want to work, and, and neither do agents, by the way, want to work with authors who only have one book in them, and they haven't really given that some thought. So when you're, you know, thinking about your project, think about books two and three. That's really good advice. Mm-hmm. I, uh, I hadn't actually come across that that before. Um, I didn't realize that there was really that that expectation there. So does it make sense in uh, in a proposal to to talk about um, uh, additional content or to talk about setting the the the, the other the, the next book and even the third book, setting it up with the uh, with the first? It's, is that um, it, it it it's always a good idea as long as they're connected, and you don't need to go into a lot of detail, um, and. With fiction, it's essential. Um, I realize we're not talking about fiction here. With fiction, it's essential. With nonfiction, it's it's really helpful. And again, with business books, publishers. I mean, how many how many business authors do you know that have, you know, three, four, a dozen books? Yeah. And that's what publishers want. They want to be able to go back to somebody they know that has a track record. Even in the tra- even if that track record is mid list, as long as it's steady and it's mid list, that's okay. Yeah, you're talking about business authors having two or three books. Um, reminds me of a of a quote uh, that applies to what you were talking about earlier that a publisher not wanting to to work, some unwilling to work directly with an author or some preferring to work uh, with an agent instead of an author. Reminds me of, of Tim Ferriss in the four-hour work week. He was talking about uh, whenever you're an entrepreneur and you have a client, um, client comes on, on board, that you have to vet them um, and see how experienced they are, how mature they are in their, in their professional development because you don't want to waste time being a business school for somebody else. You don't want to take all this time uh, helping somebody understand this is what's normal, this is what you do, this is what's standard, whenever you could be taking that same time and, and making sales with other clients who know the ins and outs and what they should do. And it sounds like that's the approach that a lot of um, publishers have. They don't want to have to take the time to educate or don't even have the time to educate an author, just to argue back and forth, this is standard, this is conventional. This is uh, this is expected. This is uh, unrealistic. That's correct. Yeah, I mean they they really want the agent to do that heavy lifting for them, and that's you know that's part of what being an agent is about. And 
you know, all agents, I mean, I'm certainly, you know, it certainly happens to me. We, we, we turn down a lot of people because they, you know, they, they aren't willing to make the investment or they have unreasonable expectations or, you know, they're, they're not willing to listen. And, and, and publishers rely on agents to, you know, again, act as that filter. Cindy, walk us through um, walk us through it, your typical day, getting the uh, and getting all these proposals and them landing on your desk. You sorting through, figure out which ones go in the slush pile, which ones um, may actually uh, make it, and, and just the the whole that whole process. Walk us through the the day of a literary agent. Well, I don't know if we if we have a a, a typical day, but you know we spend. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Does any does anybody have a typical Yeah, day? exactly, exactly. I mean, well, we 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 generally, you know, I'll spend my day um reviewing proposals that come in, um chasing proposals that I've been after from some of my my authors. Um I will be following up with projects that publishers have and having discussions with them, um setting up calls or meetings with Publishers who want to speak with an author, a lot of publishers like to have a conversation with an author before they even take the project to their publishing committee. Some publishers don't have that process. And I'll also spend some time, usually, frankly, in the evenings, reviewing manuscripts. So it's kind of a... um, a mixed bag. I mean, some days I'll spend almost the entire day going through proposals. Another day I might spend time helping a couple of authors fine-tune proposals. Um, I may have some author meetings set up or some publishing meetings set up. Um, but it's, you know, you you always have something new going on. I mean, there's you always have um, something either new coming in, something in development, or something about to get published. It's always uh, it's almost like always living at the at the edge of your seat, huh? It is, but you know it's 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 not static at all, um, which is a lot of fun. Yeah, you've always got something happening, always something different um, coming up. So whenever, um, and if you could speak, maybe not just from your experience, but from your peers' experience, and then especially from your spirit experience um, on the publishing side of things, whenever a query letter and or a proposal comes in, um, what are the things that – uh, automatically disqualify it. That it, you automatically you throw it aside and say, okay, you know, please return to to sender. And what are the things that pique your interest that make you say, okay, maybe this is something I'll spend a little more time on. Maybe this is something I'll pursue. Well, if um, if it's a query that obviously isn't in my area of interest. It goes into the slush pile. Um, a lot of I, authors don't do their homework. Yeah, I hear that's a really common problem that literary agents and and, uh, and publishers have is that they'll specialize in, say, in your case, business and, and mystery, among a couple of the other ones. And somebody um, might send you something on, uh, on Westerns or, um, I don't know, Russian literature or something – that is nowhere near what what you do. That happens. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And that's a real pet peeve of, you know, almost every agent I know. It's like, you know, do your homework. Don't just, I mean, it's clear that it's just a blanket submission. Um, pay attention to the agency's proposal guidelines. Almost every agency posts some kind of guidelines on their website. And, you know, make sure that while, you know, you may not have to follow the guidelines verbatim, make sure that the requirements are there in some form. And for me, you know, I, I as an editor, 
I used to spend literally 30 seconds reviewing a proposal. If an author didn't get my attention in within 30 seconds, the proposal went into my slush pile, and that hasn't changed as an agent. So the first thing that I look for is something that is really unique and interesting. First and, impressions. Yeah. yeah, first impressions for sure, and something that is commercially viable. So again, somebody may have a really interesting, unique idea, but the market is so narrow no one's going to no publisher is going to touch it because they just couldn't they'd lose money so in that case you know that that author may be better off self publishing um and once you know once the proposal catches my attention then i go to that author's marketing plan which is the platform if there's not a strong marketing plan and the, you know, I don't see what I want to see there. Occasionally, I may go back to the author and say, look, you know, come back to me when you have a stronger marketing plan. But generally, it just goes into the slush pile. So it's really important, you know, authors need to think of their proposal as their business plan for the book. So it's not a proposal is not written for your book's audience. Your proposal is written for the publisher. Yeah. So you need to look at it from your publisher's perspective. They're going to want a unique idea, well written, well organized, table of contents, summary, chapter summaries, and a really strong marketing plan. And if you don't have a strong marketing plan, Maybe it, maybe you need to wait to write your book until you do. And telling a publisher that you'll do whatever they want is not a strong marketing plan. Yeah, that's, that's kind of uh, kind of like uh, applying for a job and in your resume saying, "I, I don't know much, but I'll, I'm willing to learn anything." Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Not not what you want to see. You know, there's something that you said in there that uh, I, I really try to to push on, uh, or at least remind business authors of, is that just because uh, a literary agent doesn't pick up your manuscript or a publisher doesn't mean that it, it wouldn't make a good book. It just means that it's not a good fit for them, or it may not be a good time in the, the market. So uh, – it's not um, it's not a, a judgment per se of of whether or not they're a good writer, whether or not the the book has has merit. It's really a, a business decision. It, it is a business decision, and you know you'd be better off as an author having an agent tell you, you know what, it's just not for me for whatever reason than for that agent to take on the project, make a half-hearted effort, and you're, you're, you're back to square one. Yeah. Um, you know, I always tell authors, just because I'm turning you, turning you down doesn't mean your project shouldn't be published. It just means we're the wrong agency for you. Um, you know, if, and, and perhaps the topic is too narrow in focus. And at that point, you know, some authors will choose then to self-publish, which is fine um, as long as they're willing to put to invest in their project. I mean, they can't just publish the book and expect it to sell. They, right. They need to well, be that's wrong. what I did with, um, with my book, The Business Book Bible. I didn't even approach a literary agent or a publisher because business authors – uh, or, who want to to write their own book? It's such a narrow market that I, I really didn't think that it it had commercial viability. I can't see selling forty or fifty thousand copies of uh, of my book, or at least not you know in in a year or two. So uh, so I went the self publishing route, and it's been great for me. I had the opportunity to um, put my thoughts out to a potential prospects and clients and the clients that I have gotten have have more than than paid for the the time and effort um 
and the money that I put into designing the the book. Um, I would love to go the the traditional publishing route, but like you say, it's sometimes it's it's just not um, not the the right the right uh, approach for the author, the book, the the market. And I'm grateful that we live in a day and age where we have um, we have that that option, right? So for those who have uh, commercial merit, they can go to a traditional publisher and have that publisher behind them and have the resources, the distribution, um, the people that uh, comes with being a going with a traditional publisher. But um, on the other hand, we can still make decent books um, and publish them as uh, as independent authors. Well, exactly. And today, self-publishing doesn't have the stigma that it had, you know, even 10 or 15 years ago. Um, because it can be done very professionally, can look really good, in some cases, frankly, better than commercial houses. So it's, you know, it's definitely an option. And I actually have clients who do both. You know, they have um, published commercially, and they have niche books that they publish on their own. And they're, you know, it, it works out well. It just really depends. And if you... Yet, whether you publish commercially or on your own, if you do get clients or see an increase in your business as a result, that's great. That's you know, that's what you should be looking for. Yeah, but uh, I did have absolutely experienced what you're talking about with with needing to have a, a good platform. Um, I concentrated all my time on on writing the book and uh, and working with the designer to, to get it out. And then whenever I released it, I realized <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't done anything to uh, to get people prepped to actually buy the buy the thing. So I, I kind of, I've, I've gone at it backwards. And uh, if I had it to do over again, I would absolutely work on creating the, the, the platform first so that whenever the book came out, I actually had uh, some people ready and, and willing to uh to buy it instead of uh <laughs> instead of having it out and it's <laughs> it's, it's so thinking. essential yeah. now it's so essential it used to be where you know publishers when it was a very different industry some publishers would be willing to to take a chance and work with you as you built your platform they can't afford to do that anymore it's just not yeah. practical so um it, it's 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 really a good thing, and if you do a good job with your self-published book, you may indeed end up getting picked up commercially, and you know you may be in that enviable position to say, you know what, I want to continue to do it on my own, or that's great, I don't want to do this anymore, I'm happy to have you take it over, or they may pick up your next book. You know, you bring up a great point, and I because I've I've heard it from both sides that there are publishers who absolutely, well, not absolutely, I guess there are no absolutes, but they uh, seriously frown on an author um, trying to, to pitch a book that has been self-published. They want to work with something that uh, that hasn't been out in any version or edition before. And then on the other hand, I read about some of the successes that you're talking about, where they self-published and they the books sold like or spread like wildfire and uh publisher came in and scooped it up and printed it um through the normal distribution channels and it was even more of a success well and and the and you hit the nail on the head i mean it's if if the self-published book was wildly successful then the publisher is going to want to pick it up because they know there's something there. If um, an author goes to a publisher or, frankly, comes to me and they've self-published their book and realize, you know what, this is a lot more work than I thought. I want a publisher to do this. You know what? It's too late. The train's already left the station. There's, you know, unless you have a really good track record with that book, no one's going to touch it. Because it's it's you know it's used at that point, 
and there's yeah, there's yeah. no compelling reason for a publisher to take on that book. Right. If the book's done it has been wildly successful and done really well, then there is a compelling reason. That makes sense. Yeah, I think one of the things authors need to remember is that publishing is a business. And at the end of the day, publishers are here to make money. So if they think they can make money on your book, they're going to offer you an agreement. If they don't think they can for whatever reason, then they're not going to. And, you know, I can tell you as, you know, as being on that side of the business, I mean, we've all been there. I've, I've, I've turned down projects that went on to do really well by another publisher and vice versa. So, you know, we've all had those experiences. Well, Cindy, let's um let's shift gears and uh and actually start kind of winding down because I know you've got uh, a huge pile of proposals and manuscripts <laughs> to get back to. Yes, I do. Let me um let me ask you what's a what's a good um a good book that you would would recommend to to business authors either a business book or a book on um publishing and and proposals something to to help them uh in their in their journey to become Well your book of course is excellent so they Thank should. you very much. Um, you should pick up a copy of that. Um and I you know I encourage authors to to read not so much so they are going to be like someone else but so they can see what else is out there i i really i really like books that approach business problems from a different perspective so if you look at malcolm gladwell or um you know the freakonomics authors in those those were business books but they weren't because they were unique and they had a really different spin and they were really interesting. So I would encourage, you know, people to 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 read books like that to get inspired but not to try to be like that author. You know, I I publishers and agents while we all want to have um a section in the proposal that talks about similar books. It's only so that we can envision where the book fits into the literature. It's not because we want you to say this is going to be the next, you know, good good to great or or whatever it is. Because those <laughs> books are anomalies. Yeah, yeah, there's only uh there's only so many next uh, seven habits of, of highly effective exactly. people. Exactly. Yeah. Great in search of excellence. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, what is a book in any genre that you think everyone should should read? You know, I I go back to Malcolm Gladwell, and I really, really enjoyed Blink. Yeah. And the reason I enjoyed it is you you were really drawn in or at least I was and it was a really unique perspective. And whether or not you agreed with his conclusions doesn't really matter. But the perspective was there and he had a way of drawing you in without you even realizing it. Yeah, he is a masterful writer. Yeah. You know, Blink for me, Cindy, it it made me trust myself more. It made me trust my instincts, my subconscious. It made me trust myself more. I mean, and if so in any business book, there should be value, there should be information, there should be something that you can take away and and and, and use. But uh Blink was for me almost. Um, I don't. I don't know. There's not a whole lot of business books that I can say helped me uh, 
enjoy myself more, trust myself more. And Blink well, was and that's one. the thing when 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 a book, whether it's a business book or any other book, impacts you at a personal level, you know that it's a really great book. Yeah, he yeah, did. He did an awesome job. Malcolm Gladwell, ladies and gentlemen. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, Cindy. Uh, um, so, first of all, what is uh, what's a great way for anybody who's listening, if they want to get in, in touch with you, um, to, to do so? And two, in addition to business, or even if you want to get specific, but what all areas do you um, do you represent? Just in case there's an author out there who, in addition to being a business writer, is also a, a mystery writer. Well, they um, anyone who's interested should visit our website, which is secondcitypublishing.com, and they can contact me um, via my email, which is Cynthia C Y N T H I A at secondcitypublishing.com, and our website lists everything we're interested in, which is most forms of nonfiction. And in fiction, it's really mystery. And we tend to specialize actually in historical mystery. Um, but for nonfiction, we'll do um, business, we'll do self-help. We've done, um, we do a limited amount of faith-based um, works. And we do um, Really anything except um, we don't do cookbooks, we don't do erotica, we don't do poetry, um, and I think that's that's it. I mean, the best the best thing to do would be to take a look at our website. But our biggest, by far, our biggest categories are business and um, and mystery fiction. Um. And if somebody isn't sure, they can always drop me a note. <laughs> Just test the waters. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, like uh, like I said, I'm sure you probably know uh, a lot of, of of people who are who are business book friendly, but um, on from the outside looking in, it's not. There aren't that many people. There aren't that many agents that that. Uh, publicize that they like and accept and even welcome business books. In fact, there's quite a few of them that advertise absolutely no business books. Hate them. I love because then they'll come my way. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad you're on our side. It's nice to have somebody out there that's an advocate for um, well, for what what business authors are are trying to do. Yeah, I I just you know I I. Grew up in the industry, focused mostly on business, and I just, it's, I feel really comfortable with it. I enjoy it. And, you know, it's, 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 it's fun. And if you get to do something that you enjoy, you know, what more can you ask for? That's a great, that's a great note to end on. All right, Cindy, thank you again so much for your time today. Well, thank you. It was fun, and I'm happy to do it again. Oh, well, be careful what you wish for. (laughs) Okay, thanks. Have a great day. You too. All right.